have you seen a change in that since you were coming up as far as like the openness to challenging ideas or what, what would your thoughts there be? Well, I've seen a lot of theories come and go. And when I started working on string theory back in 1968, when string theory was first born, it was the, the bad boy of physics. People said, mm. what? A theory of strings? That violates everything we know about particles. What? Strings vibrating in 10-dimensional hyperspace? Beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> We're talking about science fiction. Hyperspace? We're talking about wormholes? We're talking about other dimensions? That's stuff right out of science fiction. But yeah, string theory talks about that. In fact, we're up to 11 dimensions now with string theory. What does that mean when you say we're up to 11 dimensions? Well, most people think that the universe is three-dimensional, you know, length, width, height. Three numbers define where you are. Einstein comes along and says, no, there's a fourth. The fourth mm. number is time. So given length, width, height, given the time of the measurement, you now have an event in a four-dimensional space-time continuum. That's Einstein's idea. Mm. Now we realize that Einstein didn't go far enough. There are other dimensions. In fact, we think up to 11 dimensions, that that's really the universe of the Big Bang. The Big Bang was a disturbance in 11-dimensional hyperspace, and we are nothing but four-dimensional vibrations that peeled off from the original explosion. And so when this idea was proposed, going all the way back to 1968, people said, this is nuts. I mean, this is crazy. We live in four dimensions. We live in a world of particles. You're talking about strings. You're talking about music. You're talking about hyperspace. You're talking about wormholes. You're talking about extraterrestrial intelligence even. At that point, sh string theory was shut out. We couldn't get a job. Many of my friends left physics, in fact, promising physicists because they could not get a job. And then I realized, hey, that's the way science is. At the cutting edge, it's rough and tumble. Mm. If you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And to be in the heat means, yeah, to be criticized. We were criticized heavily because people said, this is nonsense. Strings, hyperspace, other dimensions, wormholes, come on, give me a break. Well, now we are in a position where we dominate a lot of physics departments. And so when I hear the criticism of string theory, that perhaps string theory is too powerful, I say to myself, well, hey, look, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. Mm. That's just the way cutting edge physics is done. At the cutting edge of physics, all theories are subject to blistering criticisms. And if you can't stand it, get out of the kitchen. But you were also able to break through fairly quickly as far as getting that to be some sort of mainstream discussion because you said you wrote the equation for in around 1974 but you started working on it in 1968 what was the what was the initial thought that made you come up with the idea of like oh it's all a string well the idea of a string came pretty much out of accident when we were analyzing subatomic particles uh, we realized that there's a whole array of subatomic particles and how do you make sense of it? Is Mother Nature so cruel as to create a universe, not a simple universe, but a universe of so many particles that vibrate in all directions? I mean, it's, it's nonsense. And then you realize that if it's a vibrating string, everything falls into place. Because mm. then you realize it's music. For example, 2,000 years ago, there was a debate between Greek philosophers. Pythagoras, the guy who invented, uh, discovered Pythagorean theorem. Pythagoras said, no, 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 the universe is not made out of atoms, which is what Democritus said. No, it's strings, said Pythagoras. And how mm. did he get the idea? He went to a blacksmith store one day, and he saw the blacksmith pounding pieces of metal, the longer the metal being pounded, the lower the note. Mm. And then he saw a lyre string, and it was the same thing. The longer the lyre string, the lower the note. So how many notes are there on a lyre string? How many notes can you make on a sword? And then he realized, infinite number. There's an infinite number of vibrations that you can make on a string, on a lyre string, and that's why we have music. And so then Pythagoras started a school 
a school where he said that strings is the music of the universe. Mm. This is the paradigm that unites everything. But unfortunately, the Roman Empire fell apart. And for the next 2,000 years, uh, science was plunged in darkness. Mm. So the idea never went anywhere. But the kernel of the idea was actually 2,000 years old. Yeah, actually, to take a little sidestep on that, because I had read that, I think that was in your book. I was reading it there in, in the new one, Quantum Supremacy, which we're, we're going to talk about that today. But why is it that science didn't have any progress? Because some of these things you were talking about were like right at the end of the BC times. And then, as you said, we really got to say the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s, where for the first time in a long time, we took a step forward. What, even through guys like, like, Leonardo da Vinci and and different people from history that we know existed within that time why didn't or Galileo Isaac Newton like why do you say it didn't necessarily move forward well the sad to say but the Roman Empire fell apart and uh, the greatest works of these great scientists were in a library the library at Alexandria and the library was burned to the ground and just think about it, the, the sum total of human knowledge basically disappeared with the fall of the Roman Empire. And it took another, what, 1,500 years <laughs> to gradually inch our way back up to that point. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, around 1900 or so, uh, there was a shipwreck off the coast of Greece, mm -hmm. and divers found an instrument encrusted in coral. It looked like a piece of junk. But when they cleaned it, they realized, no, it's a machine, a machine that is 2,000 years old. And then, then they took x-rays of it, and they realized it's a computer. My God, a computer. They a computer. Think a computer that was to, supposed to be a gift to Julius Caesar. But the ship uh, sunk, and it was there at the bottom of the uh, Mediterranean for 2,000 years until divers found it. How and did they know it was going to be a gift to Julius Caesar? This, this is, is so interesting. This is a speculation because they know more or less when the shipwreck took place and uh, what was happening there that could, that could create a gift of some sort, a fantastically complicated gift. And when they moved the coral away, they found out that it was a computer. It was an analog computer that modeled the universe. The universe known at that time, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, like a planetarium, a little planetarium that you could put on a desktop that modeled the known universe 2,000 years ago. Mm. It predicted the eclipses of the moon. It predicted the motion of the sun and the motion of the planets. How do they do that? Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.